So welcome to the Demography Today lecture series, sponsored by the BBVA Foundation and in collaboration with the Spanish National Research Council and Lompop Horizon 2020 project. And we are uh, lucky today to have here Tommy Benson, Professor of Demography and Economic History at Lund University in Sweden, working in both historical and contemporary economic demography. Until 2014, he was director of the Center for Economic Demography, one of the leading centers in, on demography in Europe, which he started in 2006. The center today has 40 scholars and doctoral students from different disciplines. Uh, his historical studies include the analysis of demographic response to short-term economic stress, as well as how conditions in early life influence social mobility, fertility, and longevity. His contemporary studies are on the economic and social integration of the immigrant population in Sweden and on population aging. A distinctive feature of his research is the use of longitudinal individual data combined with community-wide information on economic and institutional factors. And he has initiated several international comparative projects uh, that use this kind of approach. He was also one of the initiators, uh, initiators of the Agenda project, which deals with the, the economic transfer across generations in an aging Europe. So welcome to, uh, to Demography Today lectures. And uh, as usual, uh, we have around one hour lecture, and then uh, we will open the floor for questions. Why should we worry about population aging? What is the problem and how big is the problem? Well, today, the Swedish elderly are heavily dependent on transfers from, from the state, on public transfers and transfers from the welfare state. And if the share of elderly is increasing, there's a risk of a financial dip for the welfare state. So the welfare state needs more and more money to provide for social care and health care and pensions for the elderly. And regardless of the funding, regardless if it's funded over the welfare state or if it's funded through savings or transfers from children or whatever. Anyway, consumption of the elderly is always provided for from the workers, you know. So regardless if we fund it in one way or the other way, it depends on, on the workers or what they produce. More elderly per worker means, of course, more transfers, I mean. So the question is what we can do about it. Is there an economic or a demographic uh, solution to the problem? If we are increasing fertility and having more babies, will that help us and get more people into the labor force that way? Or more migrants, having more immigrants coming to our country to work and so on. But will that sort of create a bigger labor force and, and solve the problems with the increase uh, of the share of elderly? Or do we need to work harder to be more productive and work more hours? Is that the way and then earn more money and that way have a bit of better base for, for the, uh, the transfers uh, uh, to the elderly? Or do we simply need to work more years to start earlier or even more important to work at a higher age uh, than we do today? So these are the questions I will bring up at, at, at uh, the end of my presentation again and go over in detail. But let me first start with an overview of how it has been taking place. How has Sweden developed over time and how are we doing comparative to other countries? So this graph shows the population ages 65 and over in relation to ages 20 to 64. So regardless if people are working or not in ages 20 to 64, so this is just a simple demographic measurement. It starts in 1950 and continues uh, up until today and then with forecast or to 2015, have forecasts up to 2100. And as you can see from, from the graph, so Sweden was sort of on the forefront of population aging uh, in the 1990s. So it probably had the highest, among the highest shares of elderly of any country in the world. And you can see that Spain is, is over here. And, and, and uh, Spain is catching up heavily. So in Spain there will be a very quick development 
uh, of the share of elderly over time with a peak something in, in, in 2050 or so. There will also be an increase in Sweden, as you can see, quite a steady increase, not as sharp as in Spain or in Japan and some other countries like Germany, but it still will increase over time. So, so population aging is not a new phenomenon. It's been existing also in the past, in the last 100 years or so. And, and furthermore, it's, it's not a Swedish or European phenomenon. It takes place almost all over the world today. So the question is, why did the share of elderly increase? Is it due to the fact that the life expectancy has been going up? So life expectancy in, in, in 1900 was about 54 years in Sweden and it's about 80 years in 2000. So it's, it's 26 years increase. That's three months per year and six hours per day. So that's a continuous increase in life expectancy. So when we talk about population aging, most people think about that we are living longer times. But population aging can also be due to the fact that there are fewer children born. So the pyramid is getting small on its base. So the question is, what was going on in the past and what will go on in the future? So there's two driving forces of population aging. When we look into it and make some calculations, both for Sweden and, and for other countries, it's evident that the entire population aging in the 20th century was entirely due to, to, to the decline of fertility. It was not that people were living longer lives, it was that we have a smaller base. We have fewer workers entering into the labor force. In fact, the increase in life expectancy even compensated a bit for population aging. Because the reason why life expectancy went up in this period was mainly a decline of infant and child mortality. So it meant that there were more years spent in the workforce than as retired in this period. Today it's an entirely different situation. Today the share of elderly is growing because mortality is going down among the elderly. So it's a new force. So sometimes we think that if population aging wasn't the problem in the past, why would it be it today? And it might be because it has two different sources of population aging. So it's two, we need to talk about two stages of population aging in principle. So you can see this are, these are the, the demographic dependency ratios. So the total one is the share of the population below age 20 and above 65 relative to, 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 to the workforce. And the old age one is, of course, 65 plus relative to the workforce. And the young age dependency ratio is, is the 1 to 19 relative to the workforce. So you can see that, that in, in the... Um, in, in, from the 1950s onwards, there's been quite a steady increase in the proportion elderly, the share of elderly in society. Meanwhile, fertility went down. So the dependency ratio, the total dependency ratio was stable. So in, in the last 100 years, or last 50 years even, so while the share of elderly was going up, the share of young people was going down. So the number of dependent people on the workers were roughly the same. That's why, that's why population aging wasn't a problem in the past. But when we then look into the future, so now the old age, the share of people, elder is going up, the proportion of young is pretty much as stable, we assume. So now the total dependency rate goes. So we're going into a quite a different situation from the past. When we're making these calculations of dependency ratios, so basically we say that, that throughout our lives the consumption is stable. So we consume as much when we are children as when adults and at an old age. So that's the underlying idea about this demographic dependency ratio. While the income is pretty stable over a fixed period of time, we start to gain an income at age 
20 or 25 and continue until 60 or 65 or whatever. So that's a justification for looking into this uh, depend demographic dependency ratio. But what is the reality like? The reality like is like this graph here. So this shows the age-specific consumption and the age-specific incomes for different one-year age group over the life course. It's, um, it's, it's in 1,000 Swedish kroner per capita, so it's not the total consumption, it's the consumption for each individual over the life course, and the same goes for the income. And you can see that up to a certain age, the consumption is pretty stable, as we sort of were assuming we're using the demographic dependency ratios. But then at older ages, it goes up very quickly. So, so while the income is more what we could expect that is sort of like increasing from age 16, 17, reaching a peak at 45 or so, and then going down again. These numbers are from 2003, so it's before the economic crisis of 2008 and things like that, and it's been uh, pretty stable. Uh, so why is then the consumption is increasing for the elderly? What are they consuming uh, at older ages? So if we take a look at it, we can see it, it's not private consumption. So private consumption for elderly is pretty stable over time. So elderly don't consume more and more and better and better things, you know, uh, in terms of what they... It's instead public consumption. So it's in-kind consumption. So they consume social care and health care and things like that. So that's provided by the public sector. So it's, it's, that's a situation. And then, if we look at, at changes over time, so this graph shows that the most recent ones are the ones on the top. And as you can see, also in the past, this goes back to, to uh, 1985. You can see that the consumption is pretty much stable since 1985 until 2003. So what is changing is that today the elderly consume more and more social care, more and more health care uh, uh, that is provided from the public set, either from the state or from the, uh, the county office or from the, uh, the local government. We can also see that, that, that there's a trend so that people are reaching the peak income or continuing to work at a higher and higher age. They also start to work a little bit later because they are getting more and more education before they start to work. So there are some changes over time. I should say that this sort of numbers here, this increase in, in consumption, is, is not only exists in Sweden, you can see it in, in the United States and, and in Japan and some other countries as well. Not in all countries, as I will get back to later. So, uh, and if we look into a little bit more detail, I was saying that, of course, at younger ages, the transfer is to education, and, and the, uh, that's the dark blue uh, bars. And the health care is pretty much the same, increasing slightly at ages 65 and over. So it's mainly the cost for social care that is increasing in Sweden for the elderly. I mean, and that has to do, of course, with the changes in our society, with the higher uh, <coughs> employment rates for females and so on that used to provide for the, the care of the social care of the elderly in the past. So we made some calculations. So we are using this age-specific rates for 2003 on income and consumption, keeping them stable over time. Then we are using population forecasts from Statistics Sweden. The first calculation we made was for 2007, that's published in 2011. Uh, and uh, at the time, the calculated, uh, the estimated life expectancy for, 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 for males in 2050 was 84 years, for women 86 years. That's the, the calculation, so the forecasts by Statistics Sweden. And, and you can see that there was a deficit already in 2007. And that deficit grew with a factor of three, three and a half until 2050. So the depth is increasing tremendously, both due to population aging, but also to this 
specific structure of consumption among the elderly, that the elderly consume so much health care and social care. And then there was a new forecast made by Statistics Sweden a bit later. So it was just, they just added one year. And you can see that adding one year will increase this uh, def uh, deficit uh, even further. I mean. And you may think, why did they change it from with one year? And typically, different uh, Eurostat or, or Statistics Sweden and other statistics offices, they are quite conservative in estimating future life expectancy. So I would say that, that in 2050, it will be at least 85 years for men and 87 for women and so on. So most of the time it used to be even higher. So these are probably conservative uh, measurements of, of life expectancy. And of course, if the deficit was rather small when we started in 2007, so we don't have to bother because if we just multiply it with a factor three or four, it's still small money. So we need to relate it to, to some other things like the growth of the economy. And in our calculations, which are extremely simplistic calculations, uh, we found that, that it corresponded uh, to an annual increase of, of the gross uh, domestic product by capita or income by capita by between 0.3 to 0.5 percent until 2050. It sounds a bit small, but remember that quite often, like in the 80s, we had zero economic growth in Sweden. Today we have like 3 percent. So it's fine, but it's not always that we have this big growth. Or if we don't have that growth, it corresponds to an increase in pension age by about five years. That's about 1.4 months per year. And that is arguing, that, that is the calculation is based on the fact that we don't continue to increase the costs or the quality and quantity of, of health care and social care for the elderly, which we have done over a long period of time as we have become richer and richer. If we start to add better quality, which people are demanding, and, 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 and easier access to health care, then of course the deficit will increase even faster. I should say that more sophisticated calculations done by, by various scholars and authorities and so on is showing roughly the same development as our very of simple estimations or predictions for the future. So we are in the same ballpark, so to say, when we talk about the change over time. So the question is, how is it funded in Sweden and other countries? So the consumption of the elderly could be funded either by, from labour income that they continue to work, from private transfers that they could money from, from, from their children typically, public transfers, including pensions coming from the government or their former employers uh, in some cases, in some countries. Or it might come from savings. And you may notice that in some countries, savings is very important. Like in the US, elderly people are heavily dependent on their own savings. And in Sweden, they are heavily dependent on public transfers. So whatever the elderly consume over the pension system or in healthcare and social care is typically provided by the welfare state. That's why it's very sensitive. In Spain, for example, the numbers are quite different. You can see that about 56% comes from, from, from transfer from the welfare state, 51% from own savings. And quite typically, both to Sweden and to Spain, is, is that a, a, quite a small amount of money coming from, from, from even smaller in Spain uh, on working at a higher age up to 65. And also typically the elderly, they transfer money downwards to the children and grandchildren. About the same, it's about 10% of their income or 12% is going downward to, to, to help their children and their grandchildren. So of course these numbers are quite worrying in terms of people also heavily dependent on the welfare state. And, and uh, so that they can't balance it up sort of by, by their own savings and things like that. So only a small fraction of what they consume is coming from, from their, their private assets. 
When it comes to the pension system in Sweden, so we have what is called a notional defined contribution system. It was implemented in the 1990s. Before then, we have the same system as, as in Spain today. So it's trying to make a link between your contributions, how much, how much you paid into the pension system, and how much you will get out of it. So that's the basic idea, to get an incentive to pay more into the pension system. That way you will get a higher pension uh, when you retire. So contributions are to the state pension system is 18.5%, and then we have, have pension systems that are occupational pension systems or private pension systems. So that adds something like 5 to 7 or 8 or 9% in some years, uh, even uh, depending on the economic situation in Sweden. The benefits are then based on how much we have put into the system, uh, up to a certain limit, because there's a roof to, 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 hold to our contributions. And then it's divided by the remaining life expectancy at age 65 or when we retire. So if we are expected to live for another 20 years, then they divide it up so it will be equally, uh, about equally for, for this year. So, together with occupational pensions, people who retire in Sweden at age 65 today, uh, they will get about 65% of their final salary uh, in that ballpark. If you work another year, that will increase your pension by 5%, two years by 10%. So you have got quite a strong incentive built into our pension system to work longer. And quite a few people, they like to work longer to get a reasonable pension. Pension age today, you can take a pension at any time between uh, 61 and 67, and on average people take it at age 64 and a half. The system itself is stable from an actuarial point of view, but pensions will decline if people live longer and longer. So young people, I mean, they will have less than 65%, simply because they, they are expected to live more than 20 years after 65. So that's the way the system is, is sort of like set up. When it comes to, to the, um, the pension system, is, is sort of one part of the payments to the elderly. So the contributions in 2014 was uh, 272 billions, and the benefits, it was the outpays from the system was 260 billions. So it was the added money to the funds of the pension system. And then, apart from the contributions, so if you earn more than in 2000, if you earn more than 37,000 kroner, you still pay 18.5% in contributions, but you don't get anything from it, you know. So you pay into the system, but it's just a Robin Hood tax. It's used for other purposes. So it's taken just over by the state. It doesn't enter the pension system at all. It's just another tax. Of, of people with higher incomes. On the other hand, apart from the state pension system, there's also a guarantee pension system to guarantee people a certain income, even if they haven't worked anything throughout their lives, uh, uh, or a very small amount. There are housing allowances from the state, and there are old age support from the state. And they are not part of the pension system. And they are sensitive to population aiding these systems. And they are, of course, partly paid by this 17 billion, this extra tax on people with higher income. So there's a, there's a transfer uh, or, or an equalization of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, pensions. Uh. When we look at the social care and healthcare systems, so Social care is typically organized by the local community and health care by the counties, and we have 25 counties in Sweden. In both cases, it's mainly paid from a proportional local tax. We also have some fees added to that. The fees, in some cases, depends on your income. Uh, the benefits are the same regardless of your contribution, so it's very different from the pension system, of course. And... Uh, there seems to be an increasing demand for social care and health care. And of course that multiplies to the adds to the the, the effects of population aging. I mean, so that is 
why it's been increasing uh, since '85 until today, and that's why we will expect it to increase I in the future. So the question is, what can we do about it? Would more babies help us? Would more immigrants coming to Sweden help us? Or do we need to work harder to work more? Yeah, so these are the four questions we will look into. Well, more babies. I mean, when babies are born, we need to invest in them, the time from the parents and the money for their education and so on. So for the first 25 years or so, it will be a loss. So more babies now, they won't help us until after 25 or 30 years or so when they enter into the labor force. So it won't help us in this sharp increase of population aging in the next 25 years. It will have an influence in after 2040 or, 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 or 2000, even later possibly. So it will be, be uh, beneficial in a long-term perspective, but in the first uh, 25 years or so, it will be sort of like a burden instead of a, of a solution. So working more years, well, in Sweden, in ages 20 to 64, on average, we, the employment rate uh, is 77%. Is we work for 41 weeks per year. We live longer and longer, and chronic diseases are delayed, so we are healthier, for sure. So it, it should be possible to work longer. So we are healthier, we live longer, uh, so it should be possible also to work longer. But the question is, of course, do we want to work longer? Do we like to take our retirement and, and do something else? Uh, uh, to, to spend more time with our, our grandchildren or whatever. Uh, so we need economic incentives to promote people to work longer. We need a work environment, of course, that allows people to work longer. And we need to find jobs, I mean. So we need to find jobs as well, and, 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 uh, and that's a question. If we look at the development over time, so some people say we can't work longer. Our members of our unions, they can't work any longer at all. But if you take a look at, at, at this graph showing the age, not the pension age, not the formal pension age, but the actual age of, of exit from the labor force, when we stop having an income from, from, from working, uh, conditioning that we had a work to go to at age 50 because otherwise we can't leave the labor force. And it's calculations from, from 1990 to 2010. So, and for Sweden, you can see there is a slow increase with about one year over this 15-year uh, uh, period or so. Japan is pretty stable over time. The US has an increase. The Netherlands has tremendous increase over time. So they had a very low, age of exit from the labor force, and then it just goes up very quickly. Still quite a long distance to Sweden and so on. Italy and France starts to go up a bit as well, uh, and I believe the same for Spain in recent years. So first of all, when people say we can't work longer, that's not what has been taking place for the last 15 or 20 years. We had a decline before. So this decline took place in a period when we become healthier and healthier. And then there was a change over time. A change that has to do with incentives. So it has to do with, with early retirement, the disability pension systems, and with changes in pension systems. And, 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 and changes also in education levels. More and more people are highly educated and they like to gain from their education for, for, for more years. For Sweden, where we have individual level data for the entire population, uh, we looked into it into more detail, the changes over time. So this graph is, is the same, in fact, as the previous graph. Uh, it shows for, for men and women from 1981 to 2011. So there was a steep decline in the age of exit from like 65 years down to, to, to 63 and a half. And now it's been going up again. This is mainly due to, to, to unemployment problems, 
uh, for, for, for the elderly and, and the labor force. And the same development took place in Denmark and Germany and many other countries, uh, of, of Northern Europe at least. And then there is an increase, a very, quite a steep increase as you can see over time. And the gap between uh, men and women are also closing a little bit over time. So this is the sort of what it looks like overall. If we then take a look at it for different uh, educational groups, so we look at, at people with primary education, secondary education, university education. So there's quite big differences in age of exit from the labor force. So people with higher education, they stay longer on the labor market. Of course, they also enter the labor market much later. So in fact, they work shorter, fewer years than people with primary education since they have very long education. And, um, but you can see all groups are having the same development over time. So this is not just that high educated people, they can and they like to work longer. You can even see for males in Sweden that males with primary education, they have the most rapid increase in age of exit from the labor force. So of course there are people who cannot stay on the labor force cannot continue to work due to heavy work or to health conditions and things like that. But overall, this is a change uh, over time. If we then look at people with different with differences in health, here we have used hospitalization as a measurement of health. So we have people who have never been to hospital, staying at the hospital their entire life, people who've been once to hospital or two times or more to hospital. This is not a perfect measurement of health, but it tells you something when it comes to the age of exit from the labor force. But you can see using this measurement, there's quite big differences in the age of exit, bigger than we look at educational groups or males and females. So I think it's a good indicator of health still. You can see it's the same development over time regardless <coughs> what health group you belong to. So all health groups have the incentives, the possibilities to work at the higher age. I think this is very important to keep in mind. Let's turn to the question about more immigrants. So we, we've done some calculations. So before 1930, Sweden was an immigration country. We went typically to, to the United States or to some other parts of the world as well, but most people went to the United States. But from the 1930s onwards, and particularly after the Second World War, people have come from our neighboring countries, from the Baltic area, but also from Spain, from Italy, from, from the south of Europe, and, and, and from countries further away. And we've done sort of two calculations. So one is sort of a calculation where we, the blue line is simply sort of just the the, the actual number, so it's an increase of proportionality from 8 to 18 percent over time. So that's the, the numbers that exist if we just look at, at the statistics. And then we've done one calculation where we have d deducted the immigration. So we assume zero migration to Sweden. So what will the proportionality then be? That will be 20 percent instead of 18 percent. So migration the numbers per se has an impact on the share of elderly. But in the case of Sweden, it's very small. Also calculations being made by the United Nations for Japan or for Germany or for Europe in general or for Spain and other countries show that, that you need tremendous amount of migrants and you need more and more of them as they age as well. So that's not that big differences, you know, uh, as, as we might uh, think about. Otherwise, migrants, they, they look like the ideal people to come to a country. Because someone else has paid for their education. So if they're coming like at age 25, that's when they're becoming producing more than they are consuming. They're becoming taxpayers and so on, I mean. So that's what we would like to have to, to, to help us with the, to, to contribute to the uh, transfers uh, to the elderly. So it looks like sort of like an ideal solution that the immigrants are coming to a richer country than they are 
bleeding from and getting better off at the same time uh, we, we, will, uh, we will earn from, from, uh, from their labor. Uh, and uh, this is some recent statistics um, uh, and showing uh, that uh, situation in 2016 is produced by, by, uh, by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Nordic regions. You can see, so these are the EU 28, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Iceland and Norway. This is the employment rate for native born, that's a red one. The blue one is born in another EU country, and this is born outside EU. You can see for Sweden over here, that the employment rate for Swedes are pretty close to 80% in this age group. If you look at that 20 to 64, it's a matter of fact 82%, so it's slightly higher. This is a pretty wide age span, because most people in ages 15 to 20, they go to school, I mean, so they shouldn't be included in this calculation at all. You can see people coming from, 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 from other European countries, other EU countries, they had pretty much the same level of, of, of employment. Slightly lower for females and about the same and slightly higher perhaps for males. But people coming from born outside of EU, they, their employment rate is, is only about 60% or 62% or something like that. So it's a problem sort of like, so the immigrants, they look ideal sort of, having immigrants to come and work and contribute to your country and, and, and earn a better living themselves. Uh, but it seems that they have problems of, of getting jobs and got problems of getting jobs that are paid well enough and things like that. So, uh, and demographically, they don't add as much as we might believe. Uh, this graph uh, is not published yet. It's made by a former PhD student of mine. Uh, and it's quite interesting. It shows, it shows the amount, the employment rate in Sweden I mean, over, uh, over this period, 2005 to 2011. It shows that, that Swedes, according to our information, that 80%, uh, and that's the numbers I was just talking about, have a job, sort of they earn money uh, in this, uh, even in this age interval, 55 to 64. Uh, the OECD is making a similar uh, study of, of, of the employment rates. They're looking at a certain week in October each year and, and, and for different countries. So according to OECD, it's about 70% of the Swedes in this age band that has a job. So we're using two slightly different measurements. But it's quite interesting. So, so you might think that people coming from Turkey or Greece coming to Sweden, so, so they will sort of like do as Swedes do, I mean, to, to economic, they have the same economic incentives to work longer at a higher age and so on as Swedes have, but they don't. So, so like for, Swe for Gre people from Greece in this age interval in Sweden, so it's about 32% or 35% that that works, and is, if they were staying home in Greece, the same, uh, it would be like 40% or so. So people sort of tend to keep the habits of the home country when it comes to age of exit from the labor force, the amount of, of work. So they retire earlier in Greece, and the Greek people from Greece in Sweden, they also retire a bit earlier. Same for people from Turkey, same for mountain nations. There are differences, I mean, like Polish people in Sweden, they stay on longer than if they have been living in Poland. And so on. that's pretty much what we would expect. I mean. So, uh, I don't want to speculate really why these patterns appear, but, but there seems to be something that you bring from your home country and you are persistent, uh, whatever you like to call it. So, I think when we talk about immigrants, so we must, to summarize, we must keep in mind that there are large differences in employment rates between different immigrants groups. The highest ones are for immigrants coming from the, the, the EU area. And there are, according to several calculations, both for Sweden and for, for, for Great Britain and other countries, 
substantial net gains for this immigration. So the country is earning from having Polish people coming to Great Britain or Polish people coming to Sweden or to Denmark or to any country or people coming from other parts of EU countries as well. It also shows, uh, the study shows that the pressure on wages is pretty low. Because many people think having more migrants coming means that the labor force is increasing. To find jobs for everyone, you need to lower their wages. That's a typical reaction. So we don't see that much of that. There's also a similar study done for Norway showing exactly the same factor. There is some competition and some effects coming from people who are our neighbors. So if people from Denmark and Norway and Finland is coming to Sweden, that will pressure down wages slightly for a short period of time, and then they will go back again. But people coming from the rest of Europe, out of Europe, seems to have no influence on the wage levels in Sweden. And this is pretty much findings that this has been showing for Germany and other countries for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, but the employment rates are low, so it's very important, of course, that we validate their education and we add complementary education in language and in other types of education, and also that we have low thresholds into the labor market. Um, so increasing, uh, uh, we need to increase the employment rates, and that would certainly help uh, uh, transfers to the elderly, and also their wages are very important. So if we look at wages over the life cycle, this is for males and the, 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 the it's, it's almost exactly the same for females. So this is, uh, in, in 2014, uh, the, um, the, the income per, per capita, so it's uh, from ages 20 to, to 64. You can see this is the income profile for Swedes. This is the income profile for people from, from, from the Nordic countries. And then it's going down and down and down, and this is the income from people from, from, from Africa, African countries and so on. So there are very big differences in incomes over time. It really shows that the immigrant haven't really found what they believe they should find in Sweden, to find jobs and, and to get a good income so they can raise uh, their families. We can also look at, at the proportion who gets old age support. And that must tell us very much about the income development over the life course of these people. So if you have a low income, low contributions to the pension system, then you are dependent on this additional only support, which is not a part of the pension system, it's a part of the social welfare system in general. And you can see that for people from Sweden, for, 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 for women it's the red bar and the, the blue bar is for males, it's between like 8 to 14% to that has this old age support in ages 69 and, and over. From the Nordic countries, it's a little bit more and the same from more or less from other EU countries and from North America, South America. People from Africa, over 60% of the females from Africa in this age group needs this addition because the pension is too low, so they can't live on the pensions alone. So they need additional support. And that really tells you that they haven't found the jobs, they haven't got the incomes that they needed uh, to, to have a good life and to get a reasonable pension. Uh, so the next question is, can we get more youths into? Why wait and work more years as elderly? So can we get more youths into employment? And some people use unemployment rates in ages 16 to 20 or 24. In Sweden it was 18% in 2017, so it looks tremendously high. Still the number of unemployed are very small in Sweden. Because in this age group, people, they don't look, they're not looking for jobs, they are at school. So they should not be in the calculations at all. So that, that's why they have developed a new concept that we should use for young people. It's called neither in employment, education or training, need for short. So this is the people who are not at school or in training programs who is not working. I mean. So that's the remaining group. And that's about 7% in Sweden that are neither in these groups. And that, that's among the lowest 
in, 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 uh, that has been registered, I mean, uh, by Eurostat. So Sweden is very, very low, like uh, some of our, our, our neighboring countries and so on. Spain is a bit worse off. So the need, the proportion of, of need in Italy and Spain and, and, and some other countries is pretty high. So about 30% of young people, I mean, they are neither in school or training or have a job, I mean. So that's an entirely different situation. But for Sweden, I mean, we have very small numbers of young people who are not at school. Among these groups that are outside of this education and labor market, there are three groups. It's young, group, young people with, with functional disturbances. It's people who are dropouts and foreign born. And when it comes to the first two groups, Sweden is doing extremely well in terms of, of, of numbers and, and, and so on. And despite the fact that these groups are very small, still, they need our concern, I mean, because they are not going to have a good life if they can't get into uh, the labor market. It will have very limited effect of, of, on, on, on the funding of population aging, but the group themselves, I mean, we need to, to, to find out uh, what we can do about it. Next question is, if we can work harder to increase the productivity. To do so, of course, we need good schools, I mean, so we can be efficient. We need a well-working labor market so we can get a job that is, is, is corresponds to our education and, and, and so it's a match between schooling and training and, 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 and jobs. We need, of course, a good entrepreneurships and efficient public sector. There's quite many things we need to get sort of like possibilities to increase the productivity. Uh, there is a survey less known than the PISA survey, which is for, young, for, for children ages 15 or so. There's another survey looking at the skills. So there are skills for two age groups, ages 25 to 64, that's the dark gray, and then for young people, it's ages 16 to 24. And that's the efficiency. It's, it's a bit like the PISA test, so it's language ability, the proficiency, and the use of maths and, and, and problem, so, problem solving using IT. You can see that Japan is, is, is really high. South Korea is very high in terms of the young people, so they are doing extremely well. Uh, and then it's pretty flat over here. And there are some top ranking EU countries. And so the question is, where is Sweden, I mean? Sweden is in this group of top ranking EU countries. So young people in Sweden they do extremely well, I mean, in, in a European uh, comparison at least. Not as good as people in Japan or Korea, but they do well, and so do, do adult people, I mean. The other two countries in this group is, is Finland and the Netherlands, so we belong to this group. So for Sweden, we are in a lucky situation that we have a skilled labor. And then they have done the same test for immigrants. So this, the dark gray here shows the, the skills the same test for people coming from the EU countries, and the light grey is from non-EU countries. And you can see that, that people coming from EU countries, they have slightly less skills than the native borns. It's not that big difference. Keep in mind that we were talking about the change from like 280 down to, to, to 260 or to 255 or something like that. When it comes to people coming from outside of of the EU countries, then the situation is, is a bit different. I mean, you can see for Sweden and for, for Finland in particular, uh, and, and uh, possibly also for some other countries, there's big differences. I mean, so so for, for in the case of Spain, it's not that bad. I mean, so they have, don't have the same skills, but it's not that much lower than for, for native boards. Uh, so, so you're in a different situation. And of course, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult for them to find jobs in Sweden. For today, 80% of all jobs, you need an education, you need a skill and so on. Same goes on in Spain that more and more jobs are sort of, you need a good education to get a job at all. I mean, so it's very difficult if you don't have the education, if you don't have the language. And Swedish is, of course, a small language. So rather few of the immigrants know Swedish when they come to Sweden. So, let me summarize a bit about Sweden. So, how will we find 
fund the deficit. More babies are all good, it's too late. They're coming, I mean, it, it will not have an influence until after 25 or 30 years or so. Meanwhile, it will rather be a burden to us. I like to see bigger families. And if anyone told me that the Spaniards or the Italian will have one and a half children per woman or so, like 25 or 30 years ago, I would just laugh and say that's impossible. But that's the reality today in these countries. I mean. Today in Sweden, it's, it's, it's a bit higher. I mean, it's like 2.1, 2.2 or so. More immigrants. Well, the immigrants, to, to fund the deficit, we need immigrants from other EU countries. We need high-skilled people coming to work in the industry or in the uh, whatever jobs that they find in Sweden where they can use the education and training uh, from, from their home country. Uh, and uh, of course we are also welcoming migrants from other countries outside for other reasons. Sweden is a rich country, I mean, so it should be open to migration. But that's not the type of migration that would add, would help us solving the the, the pension problems. That's what I'm talking about right now. So the question is then if we need to work harder. And so we do. I think we need to improve our skills further, I mean, to be competitive on international markets and so on. There's no other way to think about uh, uh, working harder than to improve our skills. And we certainly need to work more years. And for Sweden, we have a high, we have a low degree of unemployment among young people. Females are working, employment rates for females are close to males, I mean, in Sweden. So there's no reserve of people you can add. We have some immigrant groups that have a lower employment rates, so we like to find jobs for them quicker. Today, they might stay in Sweden like 15 years before they find a job and so on on average for some of the groups. So it's just terrible numbers, which is hard to believe, in fact. So, so that's a bit of, of, of a reserve of, of people coming in. But that's not enough either. I mean, so you need to work longer, and that's what is going on, and that will, is likely what we will see uh, in the future. So that is Sweden. Uh, that's my thoughts about Sweden, at least. So since I'm in Spain, uh, I thought I should make some comparisons that comes from my own curiosity. Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, although I believe that Spain is my second home country in a way, and I really love Madrid. Uh, but I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I was taught English and German uh, at, at school, and I never, never had the time or the energy to, to learn uh, uh, yet another language. So how do Spain compare to Sweden? Let's take a look at the graph I showed you before again. So first of all, Spain started off sort of like uh, with a late uh, aging process, but has a very rapid development ahead of I me. Mean. So Spain is, is, is in another lead in terms of population aging. It's entirely different from Sweden in this respect. So Spain differs tremendously from Sweden. And, and the development is more like in Japan or partly up to a certain uh, period uh, in the next uh, 15 or 20 years, more like Germany and some other countries. And so that's a demographic part of it. So you have sort of like a, a more rapid population aging. So you have really some big differences, uh, big changes ahead. If we then look at the uh, the uh, income and consumption per capita profiles. So one of the, as a group uh, in, in Barcelona who's done some work, uh, uh, a lot of work in, in fact on, on this topic. And um, the, uh, the, the solid lines is, is Spain. So that's the consumption line and that's the income line. And you can see, and then it's compared with Sweden, that's a dotted line and that's the dashed line for the US. You can see it's, it's pretty much the same numbers up until age 45 or so. So the consumption is pretty much the same 
because something is pretty much the same up until age 65 or 70, as a matter of fact. The income profiles are pretty much the same, which is a bit surprising to me, given the, the, the low employment rate uh, for, for young people in, 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 uh, in Spain. The investment is slightly higher in childcare, uh, preschool and childcare in Sweden, but it's uh, about the same in the US. And, 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 but it's more or less the same in this. But then, then it differs, you know. So you can see that the income profile for Spain drops much faster. So people are retiring, leaving the labor force much faster than in Sweden. In Sweden, they hang on much further. In the US, even further simply because they need to. There's also one big difference is in consumption. And that's in Spain, it's a flat line in, in 2000 or 2003. Uh, uh, and uh, while in Sweden, it's going up. That's what I showed you before. So there's two differences. So the demography is different. You're aging faster. But you don't spend less money on, on the social care and health care for the elderly in Spain. So I'm not saying that it equals out, but it works in different directions. So these are two big differences. Uh, there are some calculations done by another group in Barcelona at another university. Uh, and they looked into the demographic effects, the sustainability of the Spanish pension system uh, from 1970 and then made forecasts up until uh, 2070. And they used the, the data coming from the Spanish Natural Statistical Institute, the INE data, and that's the top line you can see here. So these are the numbers. Uh, and then they made some alternative calculations. So they say, what about if we do it without migration? So then, then sort of like we will have less income, less income into the system. So this is sort of like where you pay more into the pension system than you take out. This is where you give out more from the systems. The benefits are bigger than the contributions if you're below one in this diagram. And you can see this is without the, if you take away the, uh, the baby boom generation, there was a very high, high uh, uh, fertility in Spain between 1960 and 75, and then it dropped dramatically afterwards. So these are some calculations with different demographic scenarios. Uh, in Spain, uh, as I mentioned before, contributions are, are about 33% of, of the salary and benefits uh, is about 60% of the salary. So it's roughly in the same line as, as the Swedish ones. And we're quite similar in that respect. When it comes to the funding, we are similar in some cases. But most of all, we are quite different. So in Sweden, we are entirely dependent on transfers. In, in, in Spain, a fair amount of, of, of the transfers uh, comes from the state, but a lot of the transfers is, 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 a lot of the funding is from their own savings, from their own assets. So there's a huge difference in that respect between Sweden and Spain. And, and of course, Sweden is, we are more vulnerable in the sense that we are more relying on, on, on the the, the welfare state and the pension system. And in both countries, we are transferring money to our children and grandchildren. So that's to the same extent. So that seems, on average, to be a substantial surplus among the people who retired, in, both in Sweden and Spain. So let me summarize a bit of it, and then I show one more slide and do the final summary. So there's much higher share of elderly in Spain in the future, partly because of this birth cohorts from 1960 to 75, and partly because of the very sharp drop in fertility afterwards. Um, the cost for education is pretty much the same. Income is similar up to age 45 or 50, lower in Spain afterwards. So people after that age, they, they work to a lesser extent than, than Swedish people are. Um, the consumption among the elderly is far lower than in Sweden. And it's mainly that it's lower because they, they spend, they use less, less, less transfers uh, from the children or from the society to, to social care and, and, and to welfare, and from society in particular uh, to, to uh, social care and, and health care. 
And uh, of course, that's less dependence on the public transfers since it's uh, more dependence on, on their own savings. When it's come to this group of young people, so in ages, this is ages 20 to 34, and you can see Sweden has a very low proportion that are out of the labor market, out of the educational market, not a training and so on, it's down to 7% or so. It can't be much lower than that, as a matter of fact. It's, it's, it can be a bit lower, but, but not that much lower. So, so we're doing pretty well, I mean. But it's very high in Spain. So of course, that's a big difference as well. So the un unemployment rates, and, and if you look at dropouts from Spanish schools, it's more than 30%. It's about the same for people born in Spain, for people coming from other EU countries and people coming from further away. It's above 30% at all, or not finishing schools. In Sweden, it's about 7%. And we think it's too many. So it's a big problem. I mean. So, so the, there is a big potential, I mean, to get more people into the labor force. So, so I think that, that, I think that I would probably change the Spanish pension system into a system more like the Swedish one. And that will sort of like give an incentive to working more years. So people like to work more years because they will have a higher pension. Meanwhile, they earn money, pay taxes, and that could then be used for better schools, or they could be used for health care and social care for the elderly. So in Sweden, the pension system is stable, regardless if we live at age 65 or 64 or 66 or 67. It's stable anyway. But we have created incentives to work more years. So more years doesn't save the system. The system is stable anyway. But it will save other welfare systems. It will save perhaps the health care systems and the social care systems because it would add to, to, to the total wage sum and, and, and the taxes uh, that we can, can, can use for paying these uh, transfers. In Spain, you need incentives to work long. You also need incentives to stay at school so that young people think that, that staying in school gives me a good future. That's why I shouldn't drop out. I should stay at school and do well and so on. I mean. and, and you need incentives for females, for males, for elderly, for 50 plus to, to, to work longer, to stay at work longer. Uh, so that's, I think, the, what I have to say about the comparisons as well. Thank you so much.